All right, give yourself a hand. We got it. Whoa. I am so tickled. Oh, y'all look beautiful. I don't you look great. I really do. I look very pretty. And I do too, I know. Anyway, <laughs> we have uh, one of the things that's really interesting is when you travel a lot. I mean, if you travel to other countries, mm -hmm. they have a way of speaking and doing things differently. And when you're around people who are from other countries, you kind of pick up their phrases. So, like when you're in the Philippines, Patricia picked up the word nako. She always go, mm -hmm. I'm not called, right? And that's okay. And then when you leave the Philippines, you're not supposed to do it anymore. But no, she still does it, right? Mm -hmm. When I was a little person, a little mini person, well, not mini, I guess, what, 15, 16? My family moved to New Orleans, right, which is in Louisiana. And my sister fell in love with the southern accent. She started talking like this. I'm like, oh, you're from Los Angeles. What are you doing? <laughs> but she's around all those people that talk like that, right? It drives me nuts. Anyway, so she still talks like that. And it's been like, how many years have we been away from New Orleans? So the problem is when we're around people, we can't help but pick up their characteristics. And this is where the problem comes in as you stop and think about what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to let the world affect us and change us, or are we supposed to change the world? And if we're the ones that are supposed to change the world, then how can we keep changing according to the people we're around? Does that ever occur to you? Anyone think about that? Because if someone says something, like I had this guy from New, from, from New Zealand, and he came to he worked with me as a partner for about a year. I strangled him. Anyway, um, he always go, that's cool. That's cool, right? Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's cool. Everything's cool, right? <laughs> no, it wasn't cool. I, I, was, I was hot as a pistol. <laughs> but all he would say was, it's okay. It's cool. It's cool. Now, that would be cool. I was like, damn. And then one day I caught myself saying it. I'm like, well, ah, strangle me. <laughs> but have you ever had that happen where you say things? Like there's some people that have these expletives, right? their interjections that they in, they throw in there and they say things like, you know, oh, damn it, you know, or they, you know, well, that's really freaking cute. They don't use freaking. They have another vulgar word they use instead. So, um, and if you're around those people, you pick it up too. And I was around, me and Patricia were around the people who were saying it all the time, all the time. And one day we did something, I forget what it was, and, and she dropped something, it broke something, and she goes, and I heard her and went, <laughs> you said what? And she got really, really embarrassed. It was not that she thought about it, but because the people we were around had infected her thinking. They acted away and they resulted in saying it. And so we see that and we pick it up and we make it a part of us. It's not supposed to work that way. So I'm going to be covering a little bit about what happened to Israel. Because there's a big difference between how it starts off, the way God designed it, and how it gets totally mitigated, and then it gets distorted, and then it's way off in left field. Remember, the Bible gives us three things, right? Doctrine, reproof, and what? Correction. So when you look at the Bible, all scripture is either doctrine, reproof, or what? Correction. So we're going to see that the people don't take it like that. They take the reproof as being doctrine. Or the correction is being doctrine, thinking that's how it's supposed to be. And it's like, no, understand the first usage, right? So the first mm -hmm. usage is important. So I'm going to give you a little basics of how the Bible interprets itself. So, Father, thank you right now for this great privilege, this great honor to help those who seek to understand and know your word, your heart, your thoughts and images that we can truly understand and comprehend and not, not be distracted by what the world has, has poisoned and damaged that we can see the, the truth and the greatness of your word from your perspective as your children walking in your shadow and in the footsteps of your firstborn from the dead are risen and return, Lord Jesus, your anointed. Okay, so here we go. That was a, okay, let's try this way. All right, true way of life, but we're going to be talking about social integration. Specifically, how the heck, where did this come from? Sin. How many of you have ever heard sin? What's it called in Spanish? 
pecado, and then there's pecadores, right? Pecadores. No. Pescadores? Pescadores. Sounds like fish, right? Pescado. Right. Anyway. Say what? Integration. Oh, forgot the R. Integra enter. Integration. We got the R. That's a T. But heck with it. We'll go ahead. We'll rock and roll. All right. Forgive the spelling here. All right. The editor needs to be spanked. Okay. So we're going to be understanding about what is social integration. That's where you go somewhere and you got to fit in. How many of you have been, so, been somewhere and felt like isolated and alone, right? And being that we're social, social creatures, we want to, you know, get in with everybody. We want to be, you know, have some sort of camaraderie, right? Well, the problem is people, unless you talk the way they talk, and emphasize the things they emphasize and care about what they care about, you're not going to be a part of it. So in order to fit in, you've got to change what you value to conform with them. And there's where things get a little messy. Like I had uh, someone who, was, who, who uh, was related to me, and he'd come to stay with me, and he went to visit a friend in a, in a bad part of town. And he comes back and goes, hey, what's up with you? What's up with you? I'm like, you don't know who I am? And he goes, hey, what's up? What's up? I'm like, no, that's not how you talk. <laughs> like, what happened? So when you're around people, you pick up their accents, like my sister with this stupid southern accent, right? Y'all doing? How y'all doing? Where's my laser? Psh, okay. So... But you can't help it because you want to be, but if you fit in, then they're not going to change to line you. You've got to stand firm, and then they come to you. Does that make sense? Because if you don't, then you're just going to be, because you're not a part of them to begin with, and if you adapt, you're just going to be on the lower form of the ladder. Don't go there. Just stay independent. And stand on God's word, and God will change things around. But in the meantime... So if you're placed in a situation like here and everybody else is different from you and you're the odd ball out, how are you going to fit in? Well, you fit in by not being like them. You don't try and fit in when it comes to God's word because you're going to have to get rid of God's word to fit in with them because they don't know God. We are no set. Is it easy? No, it's not. Now, I'm going to white this out so we can put it on top of it. All right. So we're talking about social integration. You can be there with them, but it doesn't mean you have to think like them, act like them, and speak like them. Just That's not wise. But the process by which separate groups or independents are combined into a unified society, especially when it's per pursued as a deliberate policy, it implies a coming together based on individual acceptance of the members of the other group, the process by which an individual is assimilated into a group. So he's a part of it. Now, now, does the Bible say we're supposed to do that? The answer is no. Joshua 23, 6 and 8. Be therefore very, what? Courageous. Why does it say courageous? Because you have to be. It is not easy to be independent from everybody else. People are expecting you to act like they are, and I'm not going to do it. I'm here to please God, not people. But that's what people want. They want you to conform to their value system. And there's too many different groups, too many different people. I'm not going to do it. And neither should you. Very courageous. It takes courage. Because they're all going to be trying to get you to change and be like them. How many girls went to school, right? How many, and you talk to other girls and they're telling you all these great things you're doing, right? And they're trying to get you to do the same. Not you, you're a guy, but you know what I'm saying, right? So everybody else is trying to get everybody else to feel that they're superior because they're doing something and then you want to join in and do it too. And that's how you wind up getting arrested. That's how you wind up getting in trouble. 
That's why you wind up speeding. That's why you wind up doing drugs, mm -hmm. all that stuff. You have to be independent, and it takes courage. It doesn't say be nice. It says be courageous. It takes a lot of courage to stand against your family, stand against friends or p acquaintances or people around you. Be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses that you turn not aside they're going from the right hand or to the left. So you're supposed to stay right on what? Course. That ye come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow down your, I mean, give them any respect, but cleave unto the Lord your God as you have done unto this day. Now this is in Joshua. Guess what happens within a few years? We wind up with this statement. Judges chapter 2, 1, 3. And an angel of the Lord came upon Gilgal and Boshim and said, I made you to go out of Egypt, have brought you unto the land which I swore unto your fathers, and I said, I will never break my covenant with you. God never breaks his covenant with us. Who breaks the covenant? We do, right? And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. Doesn't that suck? Now, that people don't understand that they have their gods. Everybody has their gods. We're not designed to be without a concept. Our brain cannot function without a concept of a god. So people who say that they're atheists, they just believe in science as their God. Science takes the place of their God. And science is a terrible God. Really bad. Now, we get to chapter 3 and it gets even worse. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and Pizzarites, and Hivites, and Jebusites, and converted them all to Judaism. No, not that. That's not what happened. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. Didn't take long, did it? That's in chapter 3. Pretty fast. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. That means everything that God said, they did just the opposite. Were they aware of it? No, they thought they were doing God's will. But they changed so far, that it never occurred to them to check to see if they were still on, on target. You see, when you, when you deviate, when you start off, I don't know if you've ever taken sailing, but in sailing, if you're just two or three degrees off from your course, it doesn't look like much, but as you continue to go forward, that path gets wider and wider and wider. Got it? So when we're trying to go to God and we're only three degrees off, it just gets wider and wider until we're way off in left, in left field. And we... That's why it's always good to do a checkup from the neck up, right? And forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam. And they thought they were right. But they were serving Balaam and the groves. You understand what a grove is? How many have ever been to Mexico? It's a strange southern country below us, right? If you go out into the, out in the outskirts, you'll find trees that are carved out, Right? And in those trees, they have a statue that's carved into the wood of, of, of a female or a male or something. That's a grove. Do it, we still do it today. And they think they're worshiping the true God. You know, the same thing today. All right. Now, keep in mind, when we're talking about, there's, in, the, in the Bible... There's only how many gods? One God. Is Jesus God? No. Right? There's only one God and, and one mediator between man and God, the man, Jesus. But all polytheistic, that means more than one God. Did the Philistines have more than one God? Yes. Did the Romans have more than one God? Yes. Did the Greeks have more than one God? Absolutely. Right. All polytheistic religions from the Canaanites through the Philistines and Greek to the Roman religion involve cult worship. That means you, you have a group, and then you take one section off, and you, 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 that's where it is. That's called cult. 
Approval from the gods did not depend on a person's behavior. Do you understand? When you're dealing with worship, all these other religions of man, it's not anything you do personally. It has nothing to do with what you do. The only thing that's required is that you have accurate observance of the religious rituals. That's all that's required. How many ever heard of the Cosa Nostra or the Mafia? What religion are they a part of? They're the most religious people on earth. They go to all the ceremonies, they have all the baptisms, they do everything. And they've also got the greatest assassinations, also the greatest crime ring. But they keep, because it doesn't, it's not necessary. When you don't have to take care, you know, it's not what you have, your behavior, but how good you are at doing the what? The rituals, the ceremonies. And the ceremonies are everything. It has nothing to do with the heart. God only concerns himself with the heart not the ceremony. And people put way too much value on the what? The ceremony and not the heart. That goes back, that's this religion, polytheistic. Each god needed to have an image, usually a statue or relief stone or bronze, and an altar or temple to which other offer prayers and sacrifices. Why? So that you can get the god to do what you want him to. And that's all the polytheistic religion is for, is to get them to do what you want on their day. So you say, okay, I'm doing this for you, and here's what you're going to do for me. Quip, quo, pro, right? So whenever you ask them, where are you going? Well, I'm going to, the, I'm going to whatever, and what are you going to do? I, well, i got to do it. Why? Because, well, I want, you know, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to get him to do what I want. How many here try and get God to do what you want? You're in the wrong place if you do. We're not here to get God. We're here to know what we need to do to be right with God. But understand, it, it depend, does not depend on a person's behavior, just on being what? Good at accurate observations of the religious rituals. That's all that's required. How many altars and sacrifice, how many altars and temples did Rome have? They had Dionysus, they had Diana, they had Apollo, they had Zeus, they had Neptune, they had Mars. These are all the temples. And each day of the week, they had one specific day to worship their god. And they'd worship the other gods each day of the week. That's why we do what we do in our culture, because we're from the Greeks and Romans. All right, but understanding, approval from the gods did not depend on a person's behavior. Didn't matter as long as you did the ceremony right. All right, so now let's look at God. Are there any Bibles to the Greek and Roman religion? No, there's no Bibles. None. All you got to do is follow the ceremony. There's no way to say you must think this, you must do this, or that. none of that stuff. All just do the ceremony. So it doesn't make any difference. All religions they're man-made, have no doctrine or standard for actions or heart or perception or thought. None. Well, how about God? Does God have one? Yeah. Starting in the Old Testament, we have that ten what? Ten commandments starting in Deuteronomy 5. So what are they? What's the first one? You're all into biblical research, right? Yeah, thou shalt not. You got the first part. <laughs> Okay, I'll give you the first one, okay? Here we go. No other gods before me, okay? I, I condensed it, right? I'm not giving you the, because it would go down to here, right? Okay, what's the second one? Y'all really, you're all into biblical research, right? All right, here's number two. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Right? Why? Because then you're going to respect it. You're going to be honoring it. All right, what's number three? Bow down. Bow down. Oh, brilliant. Oh, you are so perceptive. No, as thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Ah, I gotcha. All right, so what does this mean, take God's name in vain? Don't say God damn it. No, that's not what we're talking about. 
You know what that is? That's the word empty. How many have ever had a birthday party? Everyone giving you a presents? Nobody's giving you any presents? All right, who got presents? Me. You got, me got it, okay. So she got presents. So what would you do when someone walks in with a beautiful box with a bow and it's just gorgeous and go, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. And they hand it to you and you're like, oh, and you take out the bow and you take out the paper, open the box, there's nothing in it. Not a thing, nothing. Now, how is that possible? Well, because vain means to have it on the outside, but nothing on the what? Inside. So when they use God's name, they don't, really want, they don't want to really be talking to him. They're just there to do the ceremony. And I've been to so many rituals and, and, and ceremonies where they call upon God. And they say it in such a, an emphatic voice. They're calling upon God, but they don't want an answer. And they sure as heck don't want to hear from him. They'd probably have a heart attack if they did. So vain just means saying his name with, with, only to satisfy everybody else, but not really talking to him directly. Mm -hmm. All right, next one is remember the Sabbath day and keep it. How many got that one for number four? They don't have it at all. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's like an airplane. Yeah. All right. Now, what's number five? All right. I'll give it to you. Honor your father and mother. Right. What's number six? All right. She's, now you're looking at the Bible. Yeah. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> yeah. Bring out the ruler. All right. So we're going to go for the restroom really quick here. Bang. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Why should you not steal? Because God gave them that. Why are you going to take away that which God gave them? You don't do that. Got it. It's not like you should not steal. It's the fact that you do God's will. God will give you what's yours. And if it's someone else's that God gave them, you take care of it until you give it back to them. If you've got it. That's why you protected the people's stuff. God gave that to them. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. That means lying. Don't say things bad about people without verifying, or don't even say it at all. Thou shalt not covet. What's covet? Oh, look what he's got. I don't got that. I don't want that. You know? No, don't even, don't worry about it. I had this desire. Ah, oh, I'm, I'm into, I was into fencing, you know. You ever, you ever done fencing? Not putting up fences. I mean... With a foil, not aluminum foil, with a foil, right? So anyway, I was into this, and I've always wanted to get me, I was looking at these, you know, these um, professional foils, right? I was like, you know, 600, 700 bucks. I'm like, I can't afford that. And this guy went out to a, a garage sale, right? And, and anyway, he, he comes running in my house, right? He goes, Frank, Frank, Frank. I go, what, 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 what? He goes, he goes, I got something for you. I go, what? He goes, check this out. And he hands me a seven hundred dollar foil. Like, dude, I ain't got seven hundred bucks. He goes, "I cost me ten bucks." I went, "What?" Yeah, I went to a garage sale and they sold it to me for ten bucks. I'll give you ten bucks, but no problem. <laughs> I'll even give you fifteen. He goes, "No, no, no, you keep it." I'm like, oh man. But anyway, so who knew that I was into fencing? Only God knew. He didn't know. He just thought it would be cool to give it me. You know, so he had no idea what it was even worth. He thought it was like 50 bucks or so. No, it's a $700 foil. You know, it's for the athletics, you know, athlete, uh, Olympic, Olympic style. I'm like, wow. But anyway, I got a few other things like that. All you got to do is like, you know, just keep it in your heart and watch God blow your doors off. You don't have to covet anybody's stuff. You just close your eyes and just let go of it to God. And next thing you know, you got it. Like, okay, how'd that work? You'll never, God will just come at, you'll, it'll be yours. So you don't have to really pursue it or be jealous of anybody. So is that making sense? That's why you don't, but why shouldn't you steal? Because well, you don't need to. God will provide for how much your needs? All. And God will give you the desires of your heart. So if it's a desire of your heart, it's yours. Like, 
I wanted a sail. I wanted a model of a sailboat, right? I didn't wind up with one. I wound up with two. <laughs> two of them. I could always wanted to have a, a model of a sail, a sailing boat. So anyway, if you have your desire and you go to God, God will make it available to you. And he, he always, always. So you don't have to, you don't have to covet anything. You don't have to steal anything. God is your sufficiency. And God will never have you tempted about what you are able. If you're not ready for it, he's not going to give it to you. Does that make sense? I knew a guy that wanted an XKE Jaguar, right? He went to God. Can, I, well, I just, I want Can you help me get it? God didn't answer. So he's like, I'll go get it myself. Well, he realized when he finally he paid for it, he spent all his, all his savings to get it, and then he had to get parts, and he had to get wiring, and he had to do the wiring harness, and he had to go through and do body work. After about $20,000, he finally got it up and running. And then, sure enough, a week after he went and got it road-worthy to be able to drive it, a guy comes up there and says, I need someone to buy my Jaguar. I'll take, I'll take $10,000. <laughs> Did you understand the problem? He didn't wait. He wanted it now rather than trusting in the Lord. That's why this idea of coveting and stealing, totally unnecessary. Pardon? God meets our needs, not our dreams. Oh, he knows when we, he's not going to give us more than we can handle. And that, he couldn't have handled it, but he thought he could, and he put himself way into debt. And God provided it for him, but it was too late. He'd already made the commitment. But anyway, so there we are. There's the ten. Do you notice anything unusual about these? The first three are for who? They're for God. What's this one for? That's for God. What's this one for? Keeping the Sabbath. One day for you and for you and God. That's right. You go to God and say, God, here's all the things I've done. How did I do? And you're honest and say, how did I do? Are they okay? Could I have done better? God will then give you guidance. That's where the Sabbath day is for you and to spend time with God. Seeking doctrine, reproof, or correction, knowledge, wisdom, or understanding. Then what about the rest of these? It's for udders, right? The cows, the udders. <laughs> All right. So we have you and, so there's you and God, there's you and others, right? So here's the first commandment. To agape God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And over here is your neighbor as your what? Self. So there's your two commandments. That's why if you got this, you, do, you know, it's not so much you have to do this exactly like, but just have the same heart as if they were doing it. The heart is everything. So this never exists in any religion. You got this? There's no, there's no one goes into detail. And, if, and then you've got the Leviticus that breaks these down even further and further. Why? Because people say, well, what if this and what if that? And, All right, if that happens, then this is what you do. And that's how it wound up with the, with the amount of commandments. But if you go to the next section, this is in chapter 5, verse 7 to 21. And this is 6, 5. Now, who added chapters? Man, right? Dumb man. <laughs> he, that man should be spanked. But anyway, whoever added chapters. Because there is no chapters in the text. So chapter 5 and then chapter 6 makes you think that everything that you need to know is in chapter 5. And it's not in chapter 6, the verse 5th. The 5th verse, right? We have the symparism of all this, which is a summary and conclusion, which says, And thou shalt ag aheb, is the Hebrew word, the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy what? There it is. All, all, all. So this is this in one verse. And all this is Deuteronomy, Numbers, and Leviticus in ten, in 10 verses. Got it? How interesting this is? So the goal is to have God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, right? That's, does that make sense? Isn't that cool? So this is replaced with this. This is the great what? 
commandment. Remember, they asked Jesus, which is the great commandment? Which one of the ten? Neither. It's the simparesma, the last one in chapter, what we call chapter six, which doesn't exist in Hebrew. But this is what you're supposed to keep reading until you get to this. And they broke it into chapters. But this summarizes and concludes all that went before. So this is the great commandment. So if we're going to talk about sin, if this is the great commandment, what's the greatest sin? If this is the great commandment, then what's the greatest sin? Okay, am I speaking a different language or is it hard to understand what I'm saying? All right. And thou shalt ahab, Lord, thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. This is the first and greatest commandment, right? So what's the first and greatest sin? Not doing it. Not loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That would be the greatest sin. Some say it's murder. Some say it's suicide. Some say all kinds of crap. But it doesn't mean difference. This is a great commandment, and to break it is the greatest sin, period. Simple logic. But most people don't know this, even though that's what Jesus taught. They don't care. All they keep focusing on is these. All right, so when we say sin, what are we talking about? Have you sinned? How many here sinned today? Well, we're talking about the great commandment. I did, right? <laughs> so, huh? My shorts don't fall. All right. <laughs> they, they do slip a little. <laughs> All right, so what's sin? Did you bring any with you? You're going to share? No. <laughs> so what is this? We say it all the time. Everybody talks about it. Do you know what it is when you see it? I see sin. Ooh, can I see it again? And you understand the problem. So what is this? How many would think they already know it? How many think they know what sin is? We well, grab a Webster's Dictionary and look up. And it's full of shit. It has nothing to do with the Word of God. What does the Word of God say is sin? We all think we all know it. But that's not from the Word of God. That's from religious, religious experiences. In a polytheistic religion, improper or incorrect observance to ceremony or actions dishonors the deity or actions dishonoring the deity. That's a sin. Like say, if you were a, a uh, gladiator during the time of Rome, your god would be what? Mars. You would sacrifice to him. And if you didn't perform good, then you sinned. The main difference is what you did in your private life. Okay, what if you, were, what if you performed in the theater? What if you were an actor in Rome? You were an actor, and you, you blew your lines. What, 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 what would that be? That would be a sin. It doesn't make any difference if you killed your wife and children. <laughs> that has no bearing on this. Did you perform? Now, there was the time where, like say, for instance, I mean, how silly this is. It's not how bad, how, how morally corrupt a person is that they need to be corrected, but if they perform good, like if they were a football player, right? football player, right? And he was a star athlete, right, in football. And he killed his wife, and he killed her, a friend. And they said that's okay because he's a star football player. That would be okay? OJ okay. Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way Rome was. It's not what they were in their hearts. It's, not how, it's like, did they do their job right? Did they sing? Did they dance? Did they act? Did they perform athletically? Because they didn't. That's the only way you can piss off the Roman gods is by blowing it as an athlete, blowing it as an actor, blowing it whatever your profession is in the corresponding god. That's all that sin is in the Roman world or in a polytheistic religion. Got it? Now, where'd this come from? Well, we're talking about a polytheistic country, proto-Germanic, right? Uh, Germanic 
Germanic is referring to Germany. Remember when, how many here remember when Caesar went up there and made all those Germans Roman citizens and took them down? You guys are really old. Anyway, so, <laughs> well, what happened, Caesar went up into Gaul, right, and he, 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 had, he captured them and said, okay, you had two choices, either I kill you or be a Roman citizen and be my, in my army. Like, okay, you win, we'll be with your army, right? He made them instantly, you know, Roman citizens. So that began the infusion of the Germanic beliefs into the Latin. Now, the Latin already had peccatum, right? Now, peccatum is where we get the word, um, oh, how do you say, what's it in Spanish? Pecador, right. Peccatum is to dishonor the god of war, right? Like, for instance, if you're going to go to battle and you don't put forth the right effort, or, you, you, or you're a coward, you've dishonored, you've sinned against, you know, you've either sinned against uh, um, Jupiter or Mars, if you're shown to be a coward. Or if you're of German descent, then it's going to be Odin or Thor. Got it? So this whole concept of sin is all from the German tribes and also from the Latin. These are all polytheistic, more than one God. I say, well, what about the Bible? Is that the same for God? No. It has nothing to do with it at all. God don't care about ceremony. How are you supposed to cross yourself? You're not supposed to cross yourself. Why would you want to be crossing yourself for? Well, that's what I was taught in the name of the Father. Son. That's what you do when you enter the, the Temple of Apollo. You put your hand in the water in Apollo, the Temple of Apollo, and you put the water on your forehead and on your shoulders and on your heart. Then you go into the Temple of Apollo. It has nothing to do with God. So we have way too much of this and nothing of the Word. And today, if you go to the, tem the Temple of Apollo, you see they have a great big water basin just for that purpose. Not for bathing in, but just to splash on your body and select locations. All right. So let's find out what the Bible says. Janice, now this is going to blow your minds, all right? So everybody, everybody should be ready, set, seatbelts in place, okay? All right, Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. If, all right, now this is God talking to guess who? Cain. We're in chapter 4, verse 7. Cain. Why? Because God accepted Abel's sacrifice and didn't accept Cain. When, when they both tithed, God refused Cain's and basically accepted Abel's by immediately with fire, consuming it all. God was like, Cain's like, hey, what's up? And God says, you know, hey, what are you talking about? The answer is, if thou doest well, that word well is good. Do good. Fulfill God's word. Shall thou not be accepted when I accept you? But did he? Nope. And if thou doest not good, the word well is good, sin lieth at the door. I hate that when you walk outside and it's laying by the door. Oh, look at that. Oh, it's laying by the door. That's, the word door refers to your heart, the entrance to your heart, your reality. And unto thee shall be his desire, not, not the not yours, not what you really want to do, but what you're going to do that you would not normally do. How many have got so caught up in your emotions that you did something stupid and wish you'd never had? And that's what it's talking about. The desire shall overwhelm you and you will not do what you want to do. You'll be doing something you would never have done before. So what happened after this verse? Cain killed Abel lost his temper and killed his own brother. So what's the problem here? Sin. What's, what is it? If thou doest well, if you do good. In other words, what's doing good? Doing God's what? All right, let's try it again. Doing good is doing God's what? That's right. God said, let there be light. God checked it out. Yep, that works. It's good. So if you're going to do good, you're going to be doing God's will to fulfill his will. Well, who, who was doing that? Abel was. 
was Cain? No, he gave the absolute minimum. Here. God says, oh, really? <laughs> so God didn't accept him. He accepted Abel. So that was pretty intense. So what did Cain do? Then did he change? No, he killed his brother that came out of the competition. Okay, now this, God has to accept me. That's dumb because God didn't. It didn't work like that at all. All right, so we now understand that doing well, you're either going to do well, you, in other words, you have a goal, you have a direction as God's will, God's priorities, God's perception, and you're following along, but sometimes you get distracted and you need to get back. Sometimes you look behind you and wind up going this way when you should be going this way. That makes sense? And if you follow, if you continue on, you're going to get in trouble. So what exactly is, here they, here, we want to know what that word is, right? Because it doesn't fit with this concept, but it does something to do with the will of God, yes? So let's find out what this is. What does it say? It says sin, Frank. I know that, but what does it say in the Hebrew, right? There you go. Ha, oh, chaka. Isn't that, isn't that better? Now, I have a problem because I have two reference books. One has the H, hatat, and the other one has chatat. So which word is it? It's neither. The Hebrew don't pronounce the H's. This, this sound is really difficult to pronounce. It comes out. <laughs> it's almost a CH, but not quite. It's almost an H, but harsher. It's just a weird sound. That's why you got this stupid little dot there. It's not, it's not a CH, and it's not an H. That's why all my books go, it's an H, and I got the little dot there. Go, no, it's a CH, and I got the little dot there. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Forget it, I'm not Jewish. Anyway, <laughs> it's just they got these weird sounds that don't exist. They don't even have them in Spanish, and that's weird, isn't it? No, it's been, I, yes, you have a question? Okay. Right. So it's, I don't know if you want to call it chattel or uh, hatel. It, it's actually hatel, hatel. All right, anyway, something like that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't speak Hebrew. I have a hard time with Aramaic. Okay, anyway, what does it mean? To go astray, miss the path. How many have ever been on the freeway? No one. How many have ever been driving on the freeway? Does that help? All right. How many have ever been driving on the freeway and you're driving and driving and driving and all of a sudden you hit those little bumps in the road? You know, you go, driving along all of a sudden. <laughs> now that's sin. <laughs> You've just sinned. You just... You just went off the, the path. You didn't go too far off, or you should have went off the cliff. But anyway, you know what I'm saying? That's you missed the path. So that's that's all this means. That's all shot. Shot, 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 that word. Okay, yeah. It means to go astray, miss the path, or miss the mark, the goal. That's all this means. So when we go back to here, if thou doest well, if you stay on the path, you don't go astray. You keep the mark in front of you. That's what God was telling Abel. I mean, Cain. Did Cain listen? No, he went out and killed his brother. <laughs> Bravo. But you understand, God warned him, if you don't get straight real quick, your emotions are going to override you and you're going to do something stupid. And did he do something stupid? Yep. So to go astray, miss the path, miss the mark. That's all it means. But wait a minute. What if you dishonor God or be, by being cowardly? That's, has nothing to, that's this. That's not this. Oh, he was born in sin. What are we talking about? He was born totally astray, had no idea what the truth is, had no idea what the path was, and sure as heck had no idea what God's will was. There's no way he knew any of that. All children are born in sin. They're all born without, they're all born astray, path. If, you, if they were, if they weren't, if they weren't, if they, all right, if they were born right on with God, then what do you need parents for? I don't need to, the child will figure out how to be toilet trained. No, he won't. You've got to train him. Well, he's got to know his own sex. No, he, no, he doesn't. You got to train him. 
The stupidity is beyond comprehension. All right. This is what it means. You just, how many ever played darts? Right? Picture, there's, if I, if I had a, a target, right, with the rings, and I hold, tell her to hold it, right? And I, no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> and I went like this, and I went, wham, right? And, it, and it, it didn't hit the bullseye. It hit one of the rings. What does that mean? I sinned. No, I shot I, I, I came close, but no cigar, right? So I go, okay, one more time. I go like this. I go, whoop, and it hits the ceiling. What happens? Same thing. So I still miss the, the mark. I go, oh, one more time. I go like that, and it flies and hits that wall. Now what? It's still the same thing. There's not big sins and little sins. That's bullshit. I'm sorry. Fertilizer. <laughs> Animal dung. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, cow patties. All right. Astray from what? What path? What mark? I'll give you three hints. Doing well. But I'm going to give you a bigger hint. You see, there was a contract. Adam had a contract with God. He broke it. Cain had a contract, he broke it, and then Adam broke it again. Moses had a contract with God, and all of Israel had a contract, and guess what they did? They broke it. Now, if you have a contract with somebody, let's say, for instance, you own, you own some property, and you're renting it out. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Okay. And a person gives you the rent for the month, right? And all of a sudden, the next month comes up, they don't got it. So what do you do? They just broke the contract. They either have to come up with the money or they go. It's just an agreement. You know, you're so mean. No, I frick, I'm paying the rent. I'm paying the mortgage. I'm paying the water repairs. <laughs> you can't live there for free. You got to help me cover my costs. Or get the heck out of Dodge. You understand the problem? So when you break the contract, who has to owe who? Who owes who? The landlord owes them? I think not. The agreement was to pay them a monthly salary, so he needs to either move out or pay the salary. Does that make sense? How many have ever hired someone to do a job? And how, how many times have they almost finished and didn't and collected the money and didn't do the job? Now what do you do? Taking the, taking the small claims court. This is what they said. This is what they didn't do. They owe me. Either they finish the work or they pay, give me back my money. Yes? A breach of contract is the problem. God always keeps his part of the bargain. We have a problem. If you hired someone for eight hours and he only gives you two and he wants to be paid, what's missing? How many would still pay him his eight hours when I did two? There, what's missing? Six hours, yeah. <laughs> two. <laughs> you only work two. <laughs> You're a little short on the hours here. You only work two. And you expect me to pay you for eight when you've only done two? So what does he need to do? Oh, you want me to sacrifice my time for my family? You want me to sacrifice my time when I would be at my special time with my family? Yeah. Frickin' A. That's what the contract said. You will do it. You see the problem? We don't honor, we have, the integrity is lost. If you hire someone for eight hours and he only gives you two, what's missing? Mm -hmm. Imagine going in for a massage, for eight hour massage, ah, oh, and you go in there and he does 15 minutes away, you're gone. Like, hey dude, I paid you for it. <laughs> don't stop now. <laughs> but you see the problem when we don't, we, we're willing to accept less. How many of you ever go to a cashier at a bank, hand them your check? For a thousand dollars, and they give you a dollar. He says it's only zeros. I, I think not. 
I'm not going anywhere until I get the rest of my money. <laughs> Something's missing here. You expect people to keep their commitments. Is this making sense? So, Deuteronomy 6.5, what was the contract that God had given for all of Israel? Deuteronomy 6.5, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. What happens when they didn't? When it was like half of their heart and a quarter of their soul and maybe a little bit of their might. What would that mean? They broke it. They broke the covenant. So what's missing? The rest of their heart, the rest of their soul, the rest of the, come on, you're missing a whole bunch here. That's what's owed. Got it? So this is why people, now if someone says, I haven't got money, okay, let's, how many here would like to pretend you're, you're, you're a uh, landlord? Could someone pretend you're a landlord? I mean, you want to be pretending a landlord? Okay, you're going to be my landlord, okay? I don't got any money. I don't have no money. Right? And your answer is? My answer is, I don't care. Well, you're, <laughs> well they, normally you would say, what do you have? Right, you see, if, <laughs> <laughs> jewelry, <laughs> two pints of blood. <laughs> no, what you're doing for is you want to find out what it is they have. Now, when you go to Leviticus, it says a person is supposed to sacrifice a goat, and they don't have the means, then you say, okay, two turtle doves. And if they don't have two turtle, if they can't afford a two turtle doves, can you, can you handle a handful of meal? Is God really into sacrifices? No. He just wants people to not quit trying. Give something. Does that make sense? People think that they can just not give anything in return. It's like, that's not how it works. Isn't that cool? All right. Uh, this should be all, this should be here. I, I put that back there three times, and I put it back in here, and pfft, does it again. That's okay. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. Might. All right, so if you don't give God all your heart, soul, and might, what's missing? The rest of it. Now, Psalm, now I want you to remember this, Psalm 46, 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offerings thou didst not desire. God don't want that. What is that for? That's for when you you come up short and God's like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't, whatever the excuse. All right, all right, all right. Because you owe God all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. All is all. The person says, Well, I, I, I couldn't. So you, you wind up giving an offering, right? And that's what this sin offering is about. It's not sin. It's that you fell short and you're covering for it. Ah, oh, Patricia found it. She was talking to somebody. She goes, and the question was, why did Mary, who brought forth Jesus, have to give a sin offering for his birth? If, if Mary brought forth Jesus, why did she have to give a sin offering for his birth? Because it says, thou shalt agape God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. All thy might. Well, she just gave a baby. How much can she give for God? What condition is she in? So God, I can't, God. Can't do it. I can't give you everything because I just have a newborn babe. And, that, and it requires how much of her attention? How much of her heart? So God says, okay, I understand you want to do this, but your existing commitment, you can't. So you got a choice. You can either go a lamb, two turtle doves, or a handful of meal, whichever you can afford. You can imagine a landlord sitting there saying, okay, how much, how much cereal you have? <laughs> I'll take that for the payment. Isn't that cool? God's not into the sacrifices. He's in, he doesn't want us to stop trying. 
his end for us doing the word, not getting caught up. Can you imagine if God was really into sacrifices? Imagine a parent that's really into, oh, today I get to whip my child. <laughs> I can hardly wait. What is that, sicko? You know, oh, I got myself a really long belt. Boy, that's going to be good. That would scare the What a sick person, right? You don't want, here's pictures of me whipping my son. Whoa, dude, you got some problems, right? God don't want, God's not into punishment or sacrifice. That's not what God's into. He wants us to do his what? Word. He doesn't want to discourage us. He doesn't want to give us more than we can handle. He just wants us to accept our responsibilities and what? Do it. That's it. How many have kids? What happens when you tell them to do something and they don't do it? Well, they say, okay, I'll do it, and they do it half-assly. That's a term, half-assly. What do you do? Now, sometimes if they're sick or if they got a cold, I'll clean the room. Like, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> now, just that part, I'll take the rest, right? you you got to weigh it, and God's like that. It's not this religious bullshit that everybody slams down on everybody. When my sister died, we had to sell our car. We had to, the two months of our rent had to go to the bishop so he could pray and get her out of freaking purgatory. That has nothing to do with the Bible. That's all I'm freaking Roman crap. Anyway, it's not sin. It's what? Debt. That's all it means is debt. Here's what you promised and here's what you did. Big gap there. That's all it means. All right. You understand that? It's not sin. It's what? Debt. Because they had promised, they made a commitment, and they fell short. So they're trying to let God know, I'm sorry, I want to give whatever I can because I, I didn't do my best. What does God deserve? Our best. So it's not sin. So it's properly translated debt. He wants us to become what he has destined us to what? To be. You see the promises God said about Israel? Man, you, one man will chase a thousand, which that, that happened. <laughs> that no man, seven will come at you as an enemy and they'll, they'll run from you, you know, seven ways. And what about us? They're so, but you understand, God, not in the punishment, he's in for us to be walking in his authority, his power, in his kingdom on earth. So, talking about Israel, now what's ours? John 14, 12. Here's our, here's our uh, amendum to the contract inclu that includes us. The Bible is a contract, by the way. John 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, all right, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go on to my Father. He's going to turn it over to us. We're taking his place. Wow, that's pretty hot. That's like really hot. Did I say hot? It's hot. That's our destiny. That's not Israel's. That's ours. Ours was amended to the contract. So if you accepted, if you accepted the anointed Jesus as your Lord, right, and acknowledged that he died and rose from the dead, after which he ate and drank, then this amendment to the contract is for you. So this, unlike you shall inherit the earth, we get much more than that. But all what's required? To have God's heart, God's soul, God's orientation, God's focus, and see from God's perspective, and then act real hard. you got to think of yourself as a son of God. No, I'm an asshole. No, you got to think of yourself as a son of God. But man, I'm such an asshole. Change. Quit calling yourself names. Don't worry, there's a lot of people who call you that. But what does God call you? 
1 John 2.2. 2. And he, Jesus, is that, that sacrifice. What sacrifice? Paying for your shortcomings, your debt that's owed. He paid for it. Not for ours only, but for the sins of the world. So you don't have to worry about paying. All you got to do is keep trying. Which makes me so happy. <laughs> do I tithe? Yes. Do I only share? Yes. I only share my house. But you understand the coolness of this. I don't have to worry about sacrifice or the fact that I went short. Not short, short. I mean, you know, I fell short. Not my shorts fell off. I'm saying I went less than my potential. Got it? Isn't that cool? So what's this word sin in Greek? I showed you what it was in Hebrew. But when you see it in the New Testament, ah, it says sin. Is it the same word? Does it mean the same thing? It's not the same word. It's Hebrew. Hebrew and Greek. This is Greek. Koine, to be exact. What is it? Now, here's where it gets interesting. It's not the same Hebrew word. Duh. It's Greek. But what does the Greek word hamatia mean? Hamatia. What does it mean? Ready? It means... To go astray, miss the path, or miss the mark. So where's sin come in? It has nothing to do with sin. Sin doesn't even, the, the Greek and Roman sin has nothing to do with the Bible. Nothing, zero. You, it has nothing to do with, you lose your relationship because you didn't do the ceremony right. It has nothing to do with God. God has nothing to do with that. That's Greek and Roman crap and all the, polytheistic religions. We're talking about from the Bible. Your relation with God does not change. You can imagine if you had a son and you come home and he says, you clean your room? Well, I got a half clean. Okay, today you're only half my son. But it doesn't work like that. You'd like to disown him, but there's no way. right? Part of you is in them. And they, you can't pull it out. You can't take your son and go, doctor, I want me that's in there out. It doesn't work like that. You can't, you can't do that. God's in the same boat. That part of God is in you. That's not separated. Now, what happens between your brain cells and your heart, that's a whole different story, and makes you go short than what the Word says. Does that make sense? How many have kids? How many get to the point where you just like to get, you're like, oh, are those your kids? Yeah, they're my kids, right? <laughs> part of me is in there. I'd like to get it out, but I can't, so you're stuck with them. Right? Does that make sense? I'm not saying any of you like that at all, but your kids. You'd never think like that, right? 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 <laughs> all right, isn't that cool? Hamartia. Same thing as the Hebrew. To give less than what is expected is not sin. What is it? Okay. They also emphatically responded. I almost fainted. All right, let's try again. <laughs> to give less than what is expected is sin. No, it's what? Yeah. Right. Somehow we lacked a little enthusiasm. Okay, one more time. Enthusiasm time, right? This is like really important. You can't be called a sinner anymore. Wrong, wrong religion. How many have the Spirit of God in you? Did God take it out? If it did, it's not eternal. God says he will never undo what he did. So who's the only one who flakes? We do. So God said, that's it, I'm yanking it out. He can't. Is that making sense? To give less than what is expected is only what? Death. Death. Now, why in the world did they call it translate trans, trans what is it transgression, and they called it sin, and they called it everything except what it is debt. That's all it is, just debt. You promise one thing and you can't fulfill it. God says, "Okay, okay, go try again." Now that's cool because Christ paid for it. So whatever I'm lacking in, he's got it covered. Like, pew-wee. <laughs>
I think that's really, I think that's really awesome. How many have ever fallen short from doing what you're best for God? <laughs> so what does God do? Take me out in the woodshed. <laughs> no. That's how it works. Make me go and sacrifice, you know, my dog or something. No. He didn't do that. There's no need that the sacrifice has already been taken care of for our shortcomings, our doing less than the best. Isn't that cool? So, now let's look at Matthew. And again, we see that word. What's the word in Hebrew, in the Greek? Hamartia. Hamartia, right? Hamartia. Well, there's one more place where Hamartia is used, and that's in Matthew 6, 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He's showing him how he prays. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Well, who's going to do it? He is. When you come to God, and you are you saying, I'm going to do the will? Can't make anyone else do it. It's all up to you. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Spiritual bread. What the Bible's talking about is understanding. And forgive us our... I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. And forgive us our what? Yes. That's right. And there it's translated debts, not sin. As we, as we forgive our, who are these people? The one that promised us and didn't come through. The ones that did us shortly. So when we forgive others, then we're in the right heart. Because here we are one with God, and here we are one with others. There is a two, it's first great and first command and second. That's the key right there. That is intense. You don't know what, like someone, when the guy, what, Peter asked, how many times will my, will my brother offend me that I should forgive him? Seven <laughs> times? And, pff, no, 70 times seven. As if Peter had never made mistakes or, full, or shortcomings. <laughs> Dumber than rocks. That's why it's called the Peter, the rock. All right, anyway. And forgive us our debts. How many have had someone wrong them? Right? Nobody? Nobody? Yeah, I, pff, I have, right? Well, have I wronged God? I've done less than what I had promised him and what I said, yep. So if I ask him to do that, that goes into effect when I do it for others. For all you guys that have wronged me, I still love you, okay? doesn't exist. Not mentioning names, but... <laughs> but, okay. This is not teaching, but deliver us from evil. Well, forgive us our debts as we forgive our what? Debtors, people that didn't fulfill the promise to us. And God forgives ours as we do that for others. That's the agape in God and thy neighbors thyself. So, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And, it should have been translated, which will lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. When you're doing this, you're in God's will. The right smack. That now, if that Jesus prayed that, you see it evidence with him and Peter. He's like, it's okay, Peter, not a problem. You did, no, Peter. oh, no, okay, it's okay, it's all right. <laughs> you see him do it time and time and time and time and time and time and time, time and time and time. <laughs> Peter, always, that's okay, let's forget about it. Even when he denied him, it's okay. That's pretty cool. Just live by what he teaches. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. For however, for how long? Forever. So that's pretty cool. So there you have it. It's not sin. Wrong religion. <laughs> that person sinned against me. No, we didn't. <laughs> he just didn't keep his promise. So he just did a little short. And we do the same thing to God. Debts and debtors.
Is this a secret? Yeah. Does, does a lot of people know about it? Yeah. Do they understand it? Nope. Do you understand it? Yes. And that's what's cool. Because people can't answer it. So why is it that Mary had to give a sin offering? She couldn't. She didn't have enough time to give all to God. She could only. She had her child. So God knows. I'll, I'll tell you what. You know, got a goat, two turtle doves, or a handful of meal, and he cho she chose the two turtle doves. That was cool. <laughs> but you understand, she knew that it's hard for her to do a wifely responsibilities. Right? And her responsibilities to the temple and to God, she couldn't do them. So that's why there's a way to give something and not feel guilty. Got it? I, this one guy did something really awesome for me. I mean, really mind blowing. And he's Scottish, right? And I know he's not going to accept payment for what he did. So I went out and got him real Irish whiskey. No, Scottish whiskey from Scotland. Really top-notch. And I gave it to him, and he's always one that all his life I could never afford it. I couldn't afford it either. But anyway, <laughs> I gave it to him, right? And he loved it. And he was like, wow, this is the greatest thing I've ever received. I don't drink, so I'm glad he liked it. But anyway, so he took it. He went, I took a visit all the way to his father, and him and his father sat down and drank Scotch whiskey. Like from Scotland, and they're like, oh. And then his father called in his friends, and they all had some of the best whiskey. So he's, he called me up and said, Thank you, Frank. Thank you. He keeps calling me up and saying, Thank you. Thank you. I know. I said, Thank you for what you did. But I had this debt to him. And then, you know, I don't want to be in debt. So I sacrificed a few dollars. Well, more than a few. Anyway, I sacrificed a few dollars. <laughs> Right. How many ever got married? Nobody here? Okay. Marriage is when two people, male and female, get together and make a commitment. Right. Okay. Right. How much, what did you have to sacrifice? Single. Yeah, you had to sacrifice <laughs> being single. It's a major sacrifice. All right. But there's no more sacrifices after that. No, there is more sacrifices. Right. And then daily. <laughs> The class will come to an end tonight. <laughs> All right. So anyway. Oh. All right. So. And then you sacrifice when you have a child, right? How much sacrifice do you have to do? A lot. Then you, then you want to do it again, a second time. Like, what, are you crazy? No, we're going to do it again. We're going to have a second one. Now you got to sacrifice even more. So whenever you want something good, you have to give up something that you had. People say, oh, I'm going to have to lose weight. Well, how about you're gaining health or you're gaining, you know. No, I'm losing it. Well, if you're losing it, then the first chance you get is to get it back. Because you don't want to lose anything. No. Don't think in terms of losing. Think in terms of what? Gaining. What are you gaining by your actions? You're sacrificing this. You're not losing it. You're sacrificing it to get up, to get what you want. But if you're losing something subconscious, subconsciously, which is the, you know that small part of the, the, the cerebral cortex at the bottom that says, no, don't let it go. If it gets away, get it back. So, so people starve themselves. They go out and they lose some weight, and then, then they go, and get right back, right? Because they don't want to lose anything. Don't think in terms of losing anything. Think in terms of gaining. If I get married, I'll have to give up this, and I'll lose this, and I'll lose that. Don't get married. I'll gain someone who will be with me, someone who will be tender and kind and caring. You know? What are you gaining? Not losing. Talk to people who are getting married, like, look at all you're going to lose. You're going to freak them out. They're going, well, I'm not going to get married now. Right? <laughs> Does that make any sense? All right. So, where's my take care? All right, in my pocket. Does this all make any sense? Okay, cool. Are you all blessed by this? Yes. All right, coming in for the last, 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 last screen, okay? So, here we are.
Ba-dum. This is all about social what? Are you pinching him? Then do it. I won't look. What's wrong with you? <laughs> all right. Where's social integration? You don't socially integrate. You become vital, and they will integrate themselves, and they'll talk like you. They will act like you. Got it? I even had a girl come up to me. I mean, pretty fine girl, pretty fine lady. She says, you know what, Frank? I really wanted to come in one day with, you know, with a pipe. And I go, why? And she goes, because, you know, she admired me. I thought that was so sweet. I was like, gosh, you know. But nonetheless, that's just out of respect. People will imitate you out of respect. The things you do, how you do things. You don't budge. They budge. They adapt. You don't adapt to them. It's you and who? God. And you always make a majority. Got it? That's social integration. Sin? What is it? Debt. That's right. There we go. Say what? Are you trying to say I sinned? No. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, Father, thank you for the greatness of your word, and I thank you for each person's life here, that they can truly see that they are your children, that you have caused, they have chosen them to be your dwelling place, and give them your heart, your soul, your thoughts, your images, and your priorities, and for their lives, and for all the greatness of things that we shall do. We give you all the praise and glory, Father, as you help us to stand within your shadow and truly walk in the footsteps of your firstborn from the dead, our risen and returning Lord Jesus, your anointed. All right, you ready? You are God's what? Best. Best. Mwah.